ladies and gentlemen, I thought it appropriate that I might start with a form of celebration. So I just want to run these names by you. Barcelona, Real Madrid, <laughs> Bayern Munich, Monaco, Juventus, and Leicester City. Just came to me as I was walking up. I just thought, you know. <laughs> I'm very honored. I'm very honored to be asked uh, to speak to you, and I'm very honored to be a patron of the centenary. I think it's true to say, which in a way Paul was referring to, that the university, because this kind of a date marks a landmark and marks a kind of crossroads in, in our lives, it offers up the opportunity both to look back and to look forward. And I think it also offers up a huge sense of opportunity. And that's what I briefly want to talk to you about tonight, because I want to look into the future. And I want, and you won't be surprised um, at my subject, I want to talk to you about the university's relationship to the arts. I have to tell you that when I first met Paul, um, I became very quickly his friend. Uh, he was very charming and very welcoming. And it was a great relief to me that both metaphorically and literally, he is married to the arts. His wife is the most wonderful artist. And I thought, this is the right man for the job. Um, and as he referred to um, in his own speech, there are two very particular legacies on the university campus, and they are artists, they are arts buildings. My grandpa's life there culminated in him overseeing the university college becoming a fully-fledged university. And I'm sure you know that the tallest building on the university campus, I think it's still actually the tallest building in Leicester, is the arts building. That is not an accident. Grandpa was a, a, an English don at Cambridge, and he was passionate about the arts. And for example, when he ran a teacher's training college in Isleworth, he got into a lot of trouble with local dignitaries because he felt that the students had the right to have beautiful pieces of art on the walls of the college. And he spent college funds buying beautiful local artists' work to put on the walls. He felt that was important to the environment in which people worked and lived. That now, of course, is fairly standard practice in universities, but was pretty um, innovative at that point. And of course, the other building that is on the university campus is the Richard Attenborough Arts Centre. Dad um, was asked to head up a university, uh, no, actually, in fact, a government um, report into the facilities for the disabled in arts institutions. To this day, it's actually quite a, a radical and landmark report called the Attenborough Report. And what he found 20 years ago he, he was profoundly shocking. In fact, the opening sentence of his report says, the current situation is little short of shameful. Now, over the intervening years, of course, arts institutions, along with a lot of other institutions, have woken up to the needs of the disabled and provided access perfectly properly in a, in a very sensible and proper uh, democratic way. But he thought, I'm not just going to write a report about this, I'm going to do something. And so he part-funded and founded the Arts Centre on the university campus, specifically for the disabled. Not just for the disabled to go along and enjoy an arts event or have access to look around a gallery, but to participate, to actually do art, to be a practitioner. He felt that was their right. And I can tell you 20 years ago, 20 years uh, 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 since, it has become an extraordinary success story. Uh, and my Uncle David um, came up only a year ago to open uh, an extension to the building, and the building became 100% bigger than it was. It's a huge success story, and it now just doesn't just appeal and, a, and isn't just a provision for the um, disabled, it's actually a, an accessible building for those young people who wouldn't necessarily think of themselves as being welcomed to an arts institution that just wasn't there for them. And its success story is, is quite remarkable and a great testament, I think, to the line of thought that came from my grandfather to my father and into that building. So we ask ourselves, and I ask myself, 
What is the role of the arts in the life of an, inst of an institution like the University of Leicester? Is actually, finally, in a civilized life, the arts simply a, a kind of nice luxury? The sort of thing that's nice you can, if you can afford it. And if you can't afford it, hey-ho, never mind. It's sort of nice when it's there. As you will no doubt guess, I don't believe that at all. And I would invite you to look more closely at the word at the center of this proposition, namely the word education. The word education comes from the Latin educo. It's about what you lead out from a person, not what you stuff into them. And it seems to me that the arts have a unique role to play in that. The moment of self-expression. We've seen it even with our own children or our grandchildren. You, you go and watch little Tommy struggling his way through a violin or bashing a tambourine. And it's moving. It's moving because that child feels they're cont contributing something. They're expressing themselves. It means something to them. And they get a sense of self-esteem. Self-expression leads to identity the ability to communicate. And finally, I think at its finest, it leads to something that's terribly important in our world today, namely empathy. Empathy with our fellow human being. It is, if you like, the part of our lives that looks after the invisible part of the national health. We go to our doctors, on the whole, to get well from sickness. But what looks after what goes on in here? What looks after our emotional and psychological and spiritual selves? And what nourishes that part of us, actually, a lot of the time, is both practicing and participating and enjoying artistic output. So it seems to me that when young people come to a university, they arrive at the key moment in their lives when they've probably moved from 18 to 19, where they've become adults, where they've got freedom, where they've got opportunity. And it seems to me, particularly for those who've never had the chance to express themselves, absolutely a key moment for them to find within the resources of the university every opportunity to do that. And it can be life-changing. It certainly was for me. So it seems to me, as we look forward at this point in our crossroads, that we owe them that chance. We owe them that opportunity. Artists, I believe, have one central duty, which is to seek after and express the truth. Now, the truth, pure and simple, on the whole, is not just that. As Oscar Wilde famously said, the truth is rarely pure and never simple. Truth is complex, contradictory, difficult, but it's worth burrowing down to try and find it and to relish and enjoy and participate in each artist's interpretation and version of the truth. Hamlet once said, what a piece of work is a man. And I think that's basically what artists are trying to find out. What does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to be on this earth, to be a human being? And that never-ending search which will never stop, by the way, is what artists are engaged in. But ladies and gentlemen, I think we've hit a problem here. I can certainly tell you from the world of professional theater that the arts are under attack. So certainly within my world, through my career, I'm 67 now, I've been working in the business for 45 years. From the time when I left university in my early 20s to now, the number of theaters around the country, particularly outside London, has shrunk hugely, shockingly. The, 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 the arts are being cut back. There is no two ways about it. But let's look at what we're talking about here. The arts in a university. The arts in education. We actually have a minister for education that publicly tries to persuade children not to study arts subjects, who, which excludes arts subjects from the national curriculum. This is shameful, and it's wrong, and it's robbing children of the range of choice that, frankly, they are entitled to.
And Paul will know, as all the people who run universities, that the arts and humanities departments in universities have also been under attack. Isn't it interesting that when dictators and despots come to power, the first pe people that they hunt for are journalists and artists. They're the first people they lock up. And I won't take a mallet to crack a nut, but I'm sure you know who I'm referring to. <laughs> so yes, it's a battle, and we have to stop this attempt either to stifle the arts, to stifle the tr truth, or indeed the more usual way of doing it, which is to trivialize it, to mock it, to make fun of it. Oh, those silly lovies that do all these plays and things. And actually, it's a pernicious way of looking at, in fact, you could argue, one of this country's greatest achievements is our culture. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think what I would hope for as we look forward to, for the next centenary is that the university will defend and in, in the arts and invest in young people, will empower them, liberate them, and inspire them. And I can't think of a finer aspiration for any university. And to be absolutely honest with you, and I've got to know him quite well, I can't think of a better VC uh, than Paul to put that into practice. Thank you.